Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is five degrees here in Louisville and a negative 12 wind chill, so we're glad you can make it. Um, this is the art of communication. And what I'm going to talk about today is how Capture Higher Ed actually creates the emails that go to the students. And if they're going to the students, they're also going to the parents, and we keep both of those things in mind. Uh, my general plan is to talk through this for maybe roughly 45 minutes or so. Um, afterwards, we will answer some of the questions, and there are also a couple documents that we've attached to this presentation that will be available to you. Um, they were documents written by me and distributed um, through various blogs and emails from Capture, and you'll be able to see them as well. So the art of communication. Uh, first of all, that's my mug. I have shorter hair now. But I wanted to quickly kind of give you some a uh, short background on who I am and how I managed to get here. So I'm the senior content writer. Um, I was the first writer hired here at Capture Higher Ed, and I've been here as of next month, five years. Um, every other writer who's come through, um, I've worked with them and trained them as well. So I came into this job as a writer. Um, I studied that all the way through college, including master's degrees and MFAs as well. So all the skills I learned from writing really get applied um, in a number of ways here at Capture Higher Ed. Everything from uh, books I've written for the company to just weekly blogs and write down especially to the haiku of all that writing, which is the email. So some of the points we're going to cover today are these six major points, and they're all interrelated in how the email actually gets constructed. So first of all, we're gonna talk about the idea of attention. And attention is something I've given a lot of study to in the last year or so. We're going to talk about the audience, specifically who is the audience today that our emails are going to, and not just our emails, but your communications as well. Uh, we're going to talk about the intention behind our writing and how we shape and manage that. And then we're going to talk about the narrative that we establish um, in our communications as uh, it goes to uh, our teenagers. I'm gonna give you some writing fine points, the specific things we look at as we review and evaluate our emails. And then I'm gonna show you the email itself, what it actually will look like when it comes out of Capture Higher Ed, or at least what one will look like. Um, it's all different branding, so it's just a matter of how your branding looks. So first of all, before you jump ahead and start reading words, um, I'd like to draw your attention to the picture over on the right. And wouldn't you like to have a crowd like that listening to you? Uh, if memory serves me right, this is Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And he is speaking in front of a crowd in New York City, probably about roughly the 1920s. And amazingly, what he's uh, doing is he is stumping for an insurance company. So he's actually up here giving a commercial. How are so many people listening to him? And the short answer is they are giving him their full attention. So attention is a concept that not only I have studied, but at this point in our history, neuroscience has given close scrutiny to for quite some time. Uh, the primary purpose of any web communication or really any communication at all before everything else is to get the reader's attention. And then within as short a time as possible to keep that attention. So when we send out an email, it is it is the most important thing to grab their attention right off with the subject line, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And if they open the email, bully for us. But the next thing we have to do is we immediately have to try to keep their attention and move them through the writing and ultimately to the CTA, the call to action. We need them to do what we need them to do. Now, what we have uh, today, our economy has gone through a lot of different, you know, a lot of different aspects. The market, the um, manufacturing economy is pretty much done in this country, and you know, it changed into what was called um, the experience economy. And I've written about this, Starbucks, you've all visited Starbucks stores, and notice how from the moment you walk in the front door, you're led through an experience. Um, you're passing certain shelves, you're passing certain items, and ultimately Starbucks's idea is to get you to feel like you're at home. Well, some specialists think we've moved out of that now into what's called the attention economy. And in the world where the internet is primary, 
and think of how much time you spend on the internet, how much time you spend on your phone. In today's online world, all these big companies, whether it's Target or Goldman Sachs or Walmart or whoever, they know that the main shortage is not money, it's not materials, it is attention. So what we have here is, is a huge amount of competition over your attention. Attention is the commodity we seek to secure, not just us at Capture Higher Ed, but everybody really in our economy. So consider this as you're you know, looking at your phones and start to look at some of the little ads you might see on Facebook and look at them carefully. What they're trying to do is get your attention and keep it. So speaking of attention, why are you here? You're busy, you have offices, and I'm sure you have families, and you know you had to get up and drive through 10 degree weather possibly. So what, what brought you ultimately to this particular webinar? And probably the short answer is, is somehow we got your attention. I got your attention, the company got your attention, and we offered you something that your brain saw as ultimately going to offer a reward. So let's talk about some of these points. When we think about the teenagers who we're communicating with, uh, consider the demands on a teenager's time today in 2019, let alone their parents. Um, we know that teenagers are spending huge amounts of time online. Um, there's lots of different social media platforms that they prefer. Um, there's lots of different websites they look at. Uh, YouTube is a huge one, especially for the young people today. But at the same time, they also have school. They might have after school, programs, sports, jobs, they have family time, they have homework time. Teenagers' lives are full, as are their parents. So technology, as I pointed out, is a major demand on their attention and your attention. Ask yourself, when was the last time you checked your cell phone? Now, I've tried to regulate it by turning off all of my little beeps and bings and trying to look at it only at three set times during the day. Not everybody does that, though. Um, Kids today are probably armed with cell phones anyway. My daughter's in fourth grade. A lot of the fourth graders already have cell phones. They're growing up in a world where that's just, that's just a standard piece of equipment. So what we're dealing with here at Capture is, is not to sell any institution. First, we have to outright compete for a prospective student's attention from every other school that is surely filling their email box, let alone the YouTube channels that they're watching. Again, um, I'm going to point out my daughter numerous times because my daughter is clearly part of this generation. Um, she is more familiar with the different things on YouTube than I am, and she's really involved in watching a lot of her certain channels. So she's very savvy. She's savvier than I was at her age because we just simply didn't have computers at all. Not to date myself. So you're not competing with other colleges. You're competing with literally everything, every billboard, every distraction, and somehow you've got to slip in underneath all of that with our help to, in order to get their attention and keep it. Um, Herbert A. Simon, I believe he was a researcher, has this wonderful statement. A wealth of information, which we've been told is the great benefit of the 21st century, actually creates a poverty of attention because there's so many things on your mind that your attention can be very scant in the midst of all that. So over here on the right, um, I just made a, a simple screenshot of Annie LeBlanc. I don't know if anybody's heard of her. I never heard of her. She is a teenager who has a channel on YouTube. Look at the number of her subscribers. And it's just outrageous. So over 3 million, almost over three and a quarter million subscribers. And she is only one teenager. There are a lot of teenagers on YouTube uh, with channels. There's a lot of uh, teenagers on different social media platforms who people follow as well. So how does she do this? The first thing we have to do to generate attention is a simple three-step movement, and this is just simply based on science and research. The first step is to capture a student's immediate attention. So the little ping on your phone, when is it is an immediate attention grabber. You know that something is going on and just for a moment, your attention is grabbed, but only for a moment. So the immediate attention uses external stimuli like a little beep, which of course all these uh, little apps on your phone have researched thoroughly to determine which one best can grab your attention. 
Um, we use ex external stimuli with provocative and unusual subject lines and images when we present our students with an email. Um, going through even your own email box um, where you're getting more marketing emails, well, look at the subject lines and notice how they might be crafted to grab your attention immediately. But that immediate attention grab can quickly dissipate. So the next step is to kindle a student's short attention. We hear a lot about a short attention span. This isn't a really precise term, but we kindle a student's short attention by talking directly to their brain's reward center. So what happens basically in the brain, and you'll be able to read about this if you choose to take the document we offer, is that the brain goes through a dopamine cycle. When your phone pings, your brain fires a little dopamine burst. And what that dopamine burst does is it creates what we call motivation because the brain anticipates a reward. It could be someone has liked your uh, post, someone is writing an email to say you've won a million dollars or they're posting a picture of your child from school or whatever it may be, you are gonna follow through because of your short attention. But the thing about short attention is once you get the reward, your attention goes away, it's over. Um, and you move on. So the same happens with our emails, and we know this. Subject line, grab their immediate attention. They read the email, we've got their short attention, but when they're finished with the email, they go away, and they forget about the email. But we want them to remember mostly your institution. So what we have to do is we have to lodge your message, a message in a student's long attention. We make them just like those subscribers to Annie LeBlanc, a follower and a fan. Um, and to, to kindle this idea, all I have to do is ask you something simple. What's your favorite TV show? What's your favorite band? Um, if you've had a favorite band for 10 years, that's long attention. You'll be now, instead of waiting for the email to come from a band like Radiohead, who's one of my favorites, you will be looking for them instead. You will be subscribing to their channels, subscribing to their page on YouTube or whatever it may be. You'll be checking their website because they've got your full long attention now. It's permanent. So with that in mind, who are we trying to uh, affirm that we can get their attention? And that is Gen Z, short for Generation Z. Now, the um, year range for Generation Z varies, um, but generally we go in kind of 15-year increments. I'm one of these uh, Gen Xers, which were kind of roughly born between 65 and 80. Uh, the Millennials, we all know them, they're born between about 80 and 95. Starting about 95, some people will say 2000, um, we have this new generation, uh, Generation Z. They have grown up their entire lives, unlike us, and really unlike the millennials, with the internet firmly intact as it is today, and technology. So a big one in technology that the millennials uh, did not have, of course, was the cell phone. The cell phone came a lot later. My daughter is in fourth grade, and by her birthday, which is 2009, she falls within that range of Gen Z. She has always been around the internet, always been around cell phones. She has always seen her parents tapping on the phones. Um, from the moment she entered kindergarten, they were immediately working on iPads. This is the lives of these kids. They are incredibly knowledge about um, all the technology. Therefore, this brings to the next point, is they completely distrust marketing and higher education. Um, but let's start with uh, marketing. Because they're so savvy in the online world, they know when they're being peddled to. They know what a commercial is, and they simply don't believe them. They don't want to be sold to, and they can afford not to be because they can simply turn the page. They can change the page on the internet. They can turn off your email, and part of that is higher education. So a fact about Gen Z that a lot of research has shown is that they uh, don't trust higher education for a lot of reasons, one of the biggest ones being student loan debt. They don't want to get into debt. The parents feel the same way. Um, interestingly, as a side point, the parents of Gen Z tend to be actually Gen Xers. They tend to be people in my generation. So the values of my generation, which came from the baby boomers before us, you gotta work hard to get what you want and all this kind of stuff, Gen Z loves this stuff and they're gonna use the technology to do it. Higher education for them takes too long. It takes four years. 
And a lot of Gen Z kids have been polled and kind of revealed that they don't want to waste that much time waiting for the final result. Um, because the kids have learned the one thing that I learned, um, and I've written about numerous times in the course of my learning photography, is I can learn anything I want in the moment by going to YouTube. And once I realized that YouTube was more than cat videos, I was astounded. There's entire channels about photography. And as my daughter knows, whole series of different channels about Minecraft, which all the Gen Z kids, of course, totally know, especially the young ones. Um, they're all into it now. They can learn anything in the moment. So the kids just simply figure, well, why not just do that? Um, Gen Z is also very entrepreneurial. This is a fact. And um, a lot of that has to do probably as people have found with what they've seen in the millennial culture. Millennials, from the whole time I've watched them, um, they have been very entrepreneurial, starting their own businesses. Gen X was not that way. Gen X was taught to get a job. The millennials were uh, kind of raised this idea of you can do it yourself. Gen Z has grown up in an age, especially in my town, of the small business owned by young people. They see that they can do it themselves. It is a fact in our culture. And that's what they want to do. Now, because of all this, and I had to learn this term, and you may have to have as well, they are more prone to respond to what are known as influencers. Uh, if we remember the commercials when we were growing up, some of us oldies, you know, they were populated by actors. Kids do not want to see actors. They want to see real people. And those real people are called influencers. It's the influencers who have their own channels on social media, especially Instagram, a lot of young people. I've looked at a lot of their pages and definitely YouTube. They host these channels and um, the kids are responding to them. So moving on to the narrative of Generation Z. Okay. We need to tell a story in emails. We need to tell a story in anything we write. We hear this word all the time now in popular culture, the narrative. The narrative that we really hold in ourselves is our story. We need to tell a story, but whose story? And the answer in short is we need to tell Gen Z's story. The most important narrative in writing and communicating, and ultimately in the act of persuasion, um, which writing really rests on, resides in the audience. As we've learned here at Capture, and as I've learned as a writer, is when you are writing rhetorically to try to convince somebody of something, and what's called the rhetorical audience, or the, sorry, the rhetorical argument, the entirety of the narrative rests in the audience, the person you are communicating with and talking to. The writing is all about them, not you. Gen Z's narrative is the one that matters. So when we are um, communicating from the perspective of your branding, the values we're trying to portray are not the values of the institution so much as they are Gen Z. And the key is to link the two. If we can convince Gen Z that you as an institution share their values, most of our work is actually done. And that is the basis of the rhetorical argument. So some of their values, in short, and this again is backed up by a, a pretty good amount of marketing research, um, which is available all over the place. I've really tried to collect it. And again, that document at the end will contain quite a bit of this. One thing we know about Gen Z is they value social justice. Um, they have grown up in an age where they have seen gay marriage. They have seen uh, racial divides being broken down. They are used to um, a world of diversity. Um, and because a lot more people are now moving into cities, especially in the United States, um, you are forced to live with people of all creeds, all kinds, all religions. They are very accepting. If you think about television shows as well, it, it would never have been considered in the 1970s to have gay characters. Um, now it's commonplace. And to the kids, it is entirely commonplace. My daughter's school is extremely diverse. There are kids from all over the city, and this is just what she's used to. She doesn't question anybody by any uh, apparent, you know, different clothing or color of their skin or whatever. It's just not there. Gen Z also values authenticity, and this comes into play with the influencers. They don't want to see actors. They want to see a real human being talking to them about the things that matter to them. Um, education of Gen Z is essentially on demand now because the internet is so thorough, even, you know, Wikipedia, as much as we don't have to trust it, it still has a lot of great information. I use it all the time. YouTube is full of great instructional things on how to fix my bathtub. I know I've done it. 
Um, and for them, they can learn how to be uh, business people. They can start their businesses by doing that. Another point to point out um, as far as education is that a lot of companies like Google, um, Microsoft as well, and Adobe, um, they offer their own certifications. Essentially, these uh, companies are offering courses they learn on the job. So as I've seen from going to Silicon Valley, uh, even as early as or as late as this summer, um, a lot of the kids are going in there when they're pretty young. They can go straight out of high school, get jobs at some of these companies like my friends did when I was graduating college, straight into the tech companies. The tech companies teach them what they need to know and they are certified. Gen Z is a generation of self-empowered entrepreneurs, therefore. They see this in the culture. They want to figure out how to do it because they want to work for themselves. Um, the days of working the 30-year job and getting the gold watch or maybe the copper-plated watch at the end, those days are really done. The manufacturing base is gone. A lot of those jobs have gone overseas, and the kids don't really want that anyway. Another thing to point out here, which is a good point, is that the reason – um, kids don't want to work a job for 30 years is because the kids know they change. Their personalities change. My personality has changed. All of our personalities change. And why would you work a 30-year job if you're going to go through changes? After 10 years, you may want to do something completely different. The kids are open to this. They know this to be a fact, so they want to have the freedom to be able to change their careers. And we see this a lot with the millennials as well. Um, Gen Z, therefore, is naturally terrified of student loan debt, as are their parents. I mean, the student loan debt has now surpassed by, I don't remember how many how much percentage, uh, the credit card debt in this country, I believe. Um, so student loan debt is now crippling the country, and they don't want to be a part of it. The kids these days are increasingly savvy with what we call their attention portfolio. You have an attention portfolio, too, and it's easy enough to sit down and make yourself a chart. Um, how much time do you spend on your phone? Write it down. Um, these kids have to do this as a survival mechanism. Um, when we talk about the eight second attention span of Generation Z kids, it's important to understand that this is not necessarily negative. And the kids don't see an eight second attention span as negative. YouTube has found, and Google as well in their research, that if you cannot capture a young person's attention within those eight seconds, they're turning you off. These kids don't have any time to waste. You must get their attention immediately or they will move on. And YouTube has learned this, well, you could say the hard way or also the good way because they've learned how to use this to their advantage. So eight seconds is a fact of life. So the art of writing. Um, we get to do some professional development around here at Capture Higher Ed and I, um, <laughs> I think it's a good, a good. This is a good uh, place to point this out. I took a course that I saw on Instagram. It was an Instagram ad. Well, this is what the kids are seeing as well. Total side note, but Instagram has gotten very good with ads, especially using videos. Um, Facebook as well. Um, these ads work. We use them ourselves, and therefore we write those as well. So Instagram grabbed my attention with a course on writing. So I got the company to pay for it, and I studied this for two weeks. I took two very long courses from this man. His name is Shani Raja, and he is a former senior editor at the Wall Street Journal. Now, the classes he teaches are on this wonderful site called Udemy. Again, side point, um, I can go to college again and maybe get a PhD, or I can go to Udemy and learn everything in 10 hours, and I chose the latter. The kids are doing the same. Um, Shani Raja's main point, and this is what I took away the most, is that the writer is an artist. Now, I studied poetry for like 30 years. I have written nonfiction for a long time. And I knew when I was hired by this company that I had to bring in that kind of artistic feeling to when we make emails. Um, art is not some highfalutin, floofy thing. It is, in fact, just the idea of being a craftsman about what we're, we're using, which is language. Language can be used very precisely and really mathematically. Um, it's not a subjective evaluation that we're doing here at Capture. We are looking at writing objectively, and that's what Shani Raja teaches. There are skills we need to master. So we take writing very seriously at Capture, and we're always working to improve through a lot of this professional development, and that means for me personally a lot of research and a lot of reading um, and a lot of dialogue within our uh, communications department as well as operations as well as the company as a whole. Uh, the fact that I'm doing this right now, this webinar for marketing, is, is again, that similar collaboration. So the writing spreads throughout our whole company. 
So let's talk about writing. There are four main points just to writing anything, whether it's college paper or your kid's uh, theme paper um, or a, a, an email or even a blog. The first is the narrative. The narrative is the overall structure of whatever it is you're writing. You must have a structure. When I was in seventh grade, we learned a simple structure, which I taught in college decades later, the five paragraph essay. Um, it is a standard narrative that allows us students, whoever, to compress their ideas into a structure. Blog posts need a narrative. Emails need a narrative. Even a toaster has a minuscule microscopic narrative that is contained in just a matter of a few words. But exiting toasters and moving up at least to emails, the paragraph is the second point of writing. A paragraph, as I taught my freshmen in college and my high schoolers, you know, one thing at a time. A paragraph is about one single idea explicated thoroughly. In terms of the emails, we have found that we need to keep them short. Um, if you look at one of our emails, which I'll show you momentarily, we try to keep them literally to three lines. And the reason is, is eight second attention span. Got to have it. The third part is the sentence. Sentences are again about a singular idea, but the way we fashion them is for what's called pacing. We want to move the student through that sentence with musicality. We want it to be really beautiful sounding um, and exquisite grammar that compresses the idea in just a matter of a few syllables. And the final point, and one we commonly argue about, is just simply the word. The right word can do amazing things. And in a toaster, every word must be absolutely precise. Um, as a fun, interesting fact, if you've learned this in college or not, um, the English language is made up of two different languages. One is what's called the Latinate, and that comes from Latin. Latin words in our culture um, tend to be polysyllabic, like the word polysyllabic. They also tend to be um, abstract. So it's, it's the ancient Romans who were talking about big ideas. And they were doing this through big words, $10 words we used to call them when I taught high school. But writing knows that monosyllabic words, which are our Germanic heritage, house, rock, and as I just learned the other day, a great German word, stuff. They pronounce it stuff. We have a lot of German words, house, you know. They tend to be single syllables and they tend to be images. They tend to be pictures. House, rock, you see that. Uh, polysyllabic, you have no idea what that looks like. So the more we can create a picture out of our emails, the more likely a student's gonna respond to it. So let's talk about the email. All of these ideas come together to fashion something for our partners that reaches out to a student strikingly and gets their attention. Sweetbriar College is one of the um, colleges we work with. They're an amazing success story and they're doing really well right now, even after almost being closed. Um, they're actually, uh, their enrollment is going up and so on. Here's a subject line. So we look at subject lines and we test them by literally what system they come into. So when I look at my Outlook email, I might see uh, part of that subject line if I look at Google email, I might see all of that subject line. So we need to think about these things because if students are doing what we know they're doing, which is looking at their phones, they're gonna see even less. We specifically test our emails against not only desktop servers, but um, anything that would fit in the palm of their hands, whether it be an iPad or an iPhone, especially iPhones. In fact, most of us, even the adults, a lot of us now are checking our stuff on the cell phone. So here's a subject line, get a private education at a public university price. Pretty, pretty straightforward. But what about it? When you analyze this, and the word analyze means literally to break down into its component parts, we see that this is a complete sentence. We don't punctuate our subject lines, by the way, um, because uh, best practices show that that's not necessary. It's a complete sentence and it's an imperative. An imperative means it's telling the student to do something. The missing subject word of this sentence is you. You get a pub private education at a public university price. Nine words chosen very precisely for reasons like this. One, we've set up a dichotomy, a, a kind of a contrast between the words private, which when we say private education, how many of you thought Harvard? Just like that, Yale. 
We know what that means, right? That's very expensive. It's, you know, these excellent colleges. But then we throw in the word public. And we know what public means. Public means University of Michigan, one of the best colleges in the country. Um, by setting those two things together and showing that, you know, the public university price is actually better, then we're doing a lot of work right there. Again, note these words, price. When a human being opens their email and sees the word price, it triggers something in their brain. It triggers a recognition and it triggers a lot of ideas that come pouring out. It's just that simple. Education does the same thing. And education is earlier in the sentence. Someone who's 18 years old opens it up and they see education. It's immediately going to snag their attention. This is about me. This subject line is 52 characters counting the spaces, but 46 without. Um, best practices kind of generally show that an email subject line should be 50 characters or less. So we're within kind of the margin of error here. And we often try to keep it much shorter. Note too that this one in particular does not include the recipient's name, though we often do that because again, best practices show that. Um, if I put your name in the subject line, it's going to grab your attention. Uh, the simple test for this is go to a party, fill it with about 50 people, uh, tell your friend to stand across the room, and at some interval where you don't quite know, say your name. Studies have shown the most likely you're going to turn your head. Even across the din, you're going to hear your name. So here's the beginning of what an email looks like. And the first part of the email that you would see upon opening is what's called the hero unit. Now, we've been doing this since, I believe, about 2014. And at that time, the industry was starting to move toward hero units. We would look at the pages of Apple computers, say, and we would see this. Um, first of all, we have an image. Nothing attracts the reader's attention like a smiling face. And this is backed up by enormous amounts of psychological research. And what this does is uh, fires what's called your mirror neurons. Try it sometime. Look in the mirror, smile. Um, look at somebody, just smile. We walk around with smiling faces as long as they're authentic. It works on people. And what it does is it makes you smile in return. We want the student to smile as soon as they open the email. The header is the first big line that you see in the pink there. Again, that color is chosen very carefully. It's part of their branding. The header is the first line that's going to grab the attention next. You are, are our number one investment. The word you jumps out, of course, and we know that we're speaking to the student. That no dot one is shortened and abbreviated from spelling out number O-N-E. Using numerals really makes a big difference. And we find this when we use percentages, for example. You can write out 60-8%, P-E-R, et cetera, or you can write numeral 6, 8%. Which one do you think is gonna grab your attention faster? Um, the word investment too stands out. The subheader is the line that follows that big header. And it's a little smaller typically. So that's our long-term commitment. What's this doing? It's making the student feel like you are a long-term commitment. Investment, commitment, all these words are standing out. Both those words, of course, are Latinate words, just so we can kind of make that connection a little better. Um, the final part is just the button. And that's otherwise known as the CTA, the call to action, apply now. Um, Red buttons, by the way, pink buttons, orange buttons, any button that has a warm color, these tend to be the best. These tend to um, trigger the most clicks we have found and other researchers have found as well. Um, we say other things besides apply now as well. It could be learn more. It could be a lot of different things. We're constantly experimenting with that. So the salutation and the email body would begin kind of roughly like this. There's your name. Um, not only does Sweetbriar, notice how it's bolded, Sweetbriar's private college tuition compare and price to that of a public university. There's that repeat of that idea that was in the subject line. It reinforces the idea. But we also offer, whoa, it's a hyperlink, generous financial aid. That word generous sounds wonderful. So we'll put together a custom award package for you. And here's something you should know, et cetera. We move on. But it begins with a name. That attracts your attention again, just reinforces it. We use bold fonts a lot because we find that if students are going to be in a hurry in reading these emails, what we want them to do is to do a little dance. I call it a dance. And we move them down through the email, bouncing from one bold font to the next. And the words that are bolded are going to be the key points. If we can just get across financial aid, sweet briar, apply now, we've done a lot of work. The grammatical structure of this first sentence increases anticipation. Not only do we do this, but, and we're waiting for it, we also do this. 
um, it engages their interest. What's next? So what you see up top here is what's called an infographic. We've been doing these for a number of years and we found they're very successful. We interrupt our email with a picture, a graphic. Um, and notice that number just leaps right off the page and is connected to scholarships. Those scholarships are available for you, shaking up the text with a visual. The sentence is following, I'll just kind of let them be for now. Um, just further reinforce the message using, again, the name, Sean, we are committed. Um, and the bold font again. And we also bring in the idea of the family, which is up there bolded, affordable for you and your family, which is a value. So you see what the email does, it points out the values that the student holds as well as their parents. This is a good deal for your family. We don't want you to go broke. We don't want you to go into student debt. We're here to help. Students respond to this. We test the emails, our open rates kind of demonstrate that. So we have found in general, and these are just kind of some general points, um, emails work best when we keep them short, eight seconds. The faster we move them through the email, interrupted by a nice little graphic, just the easier it is to keep their attention for that span of time. So why do we keep them short? Because this affects the pacing of the email. The readers move through it, grammatically and otherwise, much quicker. We keep the language simple. We don't want big words. We don't want big concepts. In the old days, five years ago, we used to try to fit everything into the email we possibly could. And we found it just, just doesn't work. It's too long. And the idea is to get them to the website. The faster we can get them to the website where they'll find all of the pertinent information, the better. That click through is just magic. The email also leads the eye. So if you've been to um, an art museum and you know visited the docents and had them show you around, you will know that artists, by the movement of their brushes, the movement of the colors, want you to move your eye in a certain direction. We want to do the same thing. So we use bold font, we use hyperlinks, we use italics, low italics, and we really like bullet points. The kids are used to bullet points, they see them all the time. And the bullet points can break down points into much shorter, easier, digestible bites. Infographics as well. So that was amazingly fast, but we're coming now, well, sort of fast, but we're coming now to the, uh, the end where we can look at some of your questions. So to sum up, what are we doing here in Capture's comm department and our operations and the company as a whole to make these emails? First of all, we have to get a student's attention. The way we do that is through compelling writing, writing that's rhythmic, writing that moves them through the email really quick, using any tool we know works so they can get to that CTA. We know that our audience is the very savvy and very sophisticated population of Generation Z. Wonderful videos online with interviews of Generation Z and letting the kids talk and listening to them. You know, we often have an idea of, you know, those silly kids. That's not the case. Um, these kids are very smart and they've grown up in a global economy. Um, as one person pointed out, um, the kids today more than likely have more in common with another kid their age across the globe than their own parent. Um, Thirdly, what we must communicate is that your institution will not only meet their needs, but match their values. And that's why they want to come to their school, but come to your school, because you have a diverse culture, because you have programs that help the poor. These are the things the kid sees, and this is what they want to do with their lives. They want to help. If you can show them you do that and you'll support them in that, they're going to be more likely to listen. The structured communications are based on these very values, affordability, community, belonging, and so on. And finally, the email is built to grab a student's attention and maintain it using the techniques that are familiar with like the short, sharp sentences, bold fonts, bullet points, and so on and so forth. In short, good writing. Um, so I can say too, just as an additional fact, here at Capture Higher Ed, um, what we're doing now is uh, running what's called a writer's workshop where the other two writers and myself as kind of the eh, whatever leader of the group uh, facilitator of the group um, we look at emails and we are constantly talking about their structure and uh, determining how to make them better what we're going to begin doing now is bringing that into the rest of the comm department and as a group uh, we're going to start coming to an idea of norms for what 
works best in our emails. And we're just constantly uh, doing more research and trying to discover new things that'll work best for your institution. So let's look at some questions. Okay, pass me on back to me now. And we have a few questions today that we will address in the next five to 10 minutes. And we will get started with those. Uh, so Sean, if you're ready, um, our first question today is going to be, what is Capture's process for email creation? Sure, so um, if you are a partner already, you'll, you'll know this, but if you're not, um, uh, we have various ways uh, for the jobs to come in, but let's just say, uh, first of all, you know, the, the institution's branding is communicated to us, and we have uh, various partners who are helping out with that. But the first step is that the campaign project managers, the CPMs, um, create the assignment. So depending on what package the uh, partner has um, kind of contracted with us, say for example, a Comflow, which is a seven email series um, that runs through several of uh, the values, affordability, the award, and so on and so forth, um, that is put together in a ticket. And we use a system called Combinize, and next that goes to our CSs, our communication specialists, who put this ticket together firmly and ask for certain points. Um, it may require certain branding um, elements that our clients have asked for, uh, certain hyperlinks, whatever it may be, and then those are passed to the writers. Now, the writers write the email based on all their training, based on all the material they have from um, our various partners. It could be their websites, it could be view books, it could be postcards, whatever they have. When the email is constructed, um, they send it back to the CS who reviews it really um, like an editor. If the CS or even the client requests changes, um, that comes back to the writer, we make the changes, and then that goes back to the CS and it runs through our QA process. And once that has been approved by the partner, that email is now firmly ready to go. So it goes through several steps and those steps and the time it takes can vary depending on uh, how quick everybody you know, gets to the task they need to do. Okay, um, so we'll go on to the next question. And that question is going to relate back to a slide that you had at the beginning of your presentation about the attention economy. Um, since you know everyone is spending for students' attentions nowadays, how does the email compare versus social media postings and stuff now? Is the email dying or is it still as relevant as ever? No, we've, we've uh, found, and a lot of other researchers have found too, that there are everybody is still opening emails. Um, the, we do the social media um, ads, and I've written those myself, um, and we do them on Facebook and we do them on Instagram as of right now. Those are the two big ones. Um, we've kind of looked around at other things as well. We will often link to YouTube um, videos, especially if the college has them, and a lot of colleges do have them now. YouTube is considered social media. But in general, I mean, our open rates um, are, are looking pretty good when our emails are really built really well. And students are definitely looking at emails. Um, an interesting thing about uh, Generation Z is how they want to be communicated with. And this has been looked at for a number of years as well in a number of different ways. Remember this idea of authenticity. Um, Gen Z wants, they want to make connections especially with colleges and college personnel. Um, they are not so involved in social media that they don't want face-to-face -face meetings, and they definitely will appreciate um, phone calls as well. Email falls into this category. So what we try to do is just keep those emails as authentic as we can. And we know that um, the students are reading them, and we know as well that parents are definitely reading them too, probably over their shoulder because the parents want to know the same information. And in that sense, we are definitely balancing the content as well to kind of really go to both. We're trying to talk to two people in a sense at once. Uh, so for our next question, we have a question about the pre-header text, um, something that wasn't picked up on on the presentation. How does it play into Capture's email? creation process. Pre-header text. What do we mean by pre-header text? 
Uh, maybe the text underneath the header, three header, or maybe the the subject line. Well, let's let's make sure. Yeah, let's make sure I answer that question correctly. Can you ask it for me just one more time? Also known as preview text. Preview text. Oh, I see. Okay, so um. Well, first of all, let me say, so um, one of the jobs that I don't do is the QA work, but um, this would be a good time to talk about the QA work. Um, the other two writers will back and forth do the very work that you're talking about. So now I think I understand. Um, if writer A writes the content, then writer B actually does the QA, if writer B and so on and so forth. So we look at all of those things through the testing systems that we use. Um, and that tests for everything, including um, what the subject line is going to look like, um, whether things are making it through the spam filter, and so on. So the, the writers and the QAers, they see um, through each of the various systems we test. And again, I can't answer this question fully because this is not actually the part of job that I personally do or have ever done. I've never done QA work, uh, thankfully, in some cases. But what we do is we test um, the emails going through a lot of different systems. Whether it's Google, it's Outlook, it's and, and so on and so forth. So the writers, and then we, and in addition, test them to what they'll look like on the desktop and what they'll look like on the phone. So we know beforehand, and from there we can make fixes as well. So if the pre-header text is what we're talking about when we, as um, I was just shown, when you open the email, you see the subject line, but you see the beginning of the text. Um, I, I believe, and I would, I would guess that that in fact is what the QA people see. Okay, and then just because we are starting to run out of a little bit of time, and I know a lot of the questions that have been asked today have been more technical, we will pass those along to members of our team and make sure that they respond to you. But to finish it off with Sean, and if if you know um, anything about the uh, non-traditional students and how how would one grab their attentions versus Generation Z? Oh yeah, I've worked with. Um, okay, well, there's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different students besides non-traditional. I've done a lot of research myself on the non-traditional students. And in fact, I just did a blog here for the company on this just a little bit ago. Um, that was saying, I think it was in the New York Times, but it was saying the wonderful fact that uh, we need a different name than non-traditional student because, in fact, the non-traditional student is becoming the traditional student. Um, a lot of people are going back to college um, for a huge variety of reasons. Um, in addition to that, um, there are other students that we look at too, and, and the class one would be the first generation student. Um, they need to be communicated with in an entirely different way. So Capture at this point is now expanding into a lot of different areas. I can't speak to like every area, but um, as we do each of these, say again, for example, Hispanic students, which we've really written to in schools that are in the Southwest, Texas is a big one. They have very strong family values. And I myself have written that into the emails, how we get their families um, involved, as well as the um, first generation students. We've worked with colleges that deal almost exclusively with first generation um, students, as well as African American students. And in the case of Sweetbriar, colleges that educate only women. So, you know, non traditional is really, it's just one more kind of group that we're we're looking at. And we look into as much research as we can get, and then we craft the writing around who we are talking to. It's always about the audience. Okay. Well, thank you, Sean, for answering all those questions for our attendees today. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, for being able to, to join our webinar on the art of communication. Uh, we, as Sean had mentioned earlier in our presentation today, that there are some free handouts that we are going to give you all today. And what we had decided to do is that those will be given to you in a follow-up email uh, with GoToWebinar. They actually only allow you to access that during the webinar. Um, so you will be able to receive those and be on the lookout for that email in the next day or two. And all the questions that we were unable to answer today, we will have a member of our team follow up with you as well. Um, so once again, thank you for joining us. And on behalf of Capture Higher Ed, 
uh, with Sean and I. Um, we just want to wish you all a good day.